In this video, we're going to cover formal charge and electronegativity and polarity. So formal charge is when we look at a molecule, a Lewis structure um, that has more than one atom, and it has um, a charge. The molecule, the entire molecule has a charge. We call that a formal charge. So to figure out when we're drawing a Lewis structure, which of the atoms is going to get a formal charge, we will just start by um, drawing a Lewis structure just like we would any, any other way. So the question might ask, draw a Lewis structure for C and minus. So we start by drawing uh, the Lewis structure, ignore the minus at the beginning. So how do we do that? Remember, we uh, our rule is draw the Lewis structure of each atom. So C has four, carbon has four valence electrons. And we draw nitrogen, which has one, two, three, four, five valence electrons. And then uh, we connect the dots, right? Connect single electrons to make pairs. One, two, three. I can make a triple bond between the C and the N. There are th three single electrons on each atom. And when I've done that, the, I check the octet rule. The nitrogen has two plus these two, four, six, eight. So nitrogen has eight. Carbon has two, four, six, seven. Carbon only has seven. So now this is where the negative charge comes in. The negative charge means add electrons equal to the charge. So if it's a minus one charge, I add one electron. If it's a minus two charge, I add two electrons, and so on. If it's a positive charge, that means that I don't have enough electrons. Remember, electrons are negative. So a negative charge means I have more electrons than protons in that molecule. If I have a positive charge, that means that electrons are taken away. So negative is add electrons. A positive charge, which we haven't seen yet, means remove electrons equal to the charge. Plus one is remove one electron, plus two is remove two electrons, and so on. So right now I have a negative charge. This means add one electron. So where am I going to add it to? This spot right here on carbon that needs one more. I'll give carbon an extra electron. Now I have two, four, six, eight for nitrogen and two, four, six, eight for carbon. So now the octet rule is satisfied for this molecule and we're going to put it in brackets and put a negative charge outside so that we can indicate this molecule is negative. It has a negative charge. It's actually an anion. OK, now that we've generated this structure, the C and the N with the triple bond, and it's in brackets, and it has a negative charge on the outside, now we're going to look a little bit further because we know that it has a negative charge, a formal charge, but which atom actually carries the charge? Is it carbon that's negative or is it nitrogen that's negative? That negative charge is actually an extra electron. Where is that extra electron actually sitting? Which atom is it actually sitting on? So the way that we figure that out is by using this calculation. The formal charge of every atom equals the valence electrons that that atom has from the periodic table minus what I call balls plus sticks. So sometimes if you look in the book, this is going to say um, bonding elect valence electrons minus uh, bond half of the bonding electrons plus the non-bonding electrons. So non-bonding electrons are balls, right? These guys right here, they're called lone pairs, electrons that are not being used to, to stick two atoms together. They're non-bonding. Those are called balls or non-bonding. If you're in the book, that's what they're going to be called in this calculation. And sticks are bonding electrons. We usually draw a line like this in between two atoms 
to refer to electrons that are in a bond, bonding electrons. So in the book it says valence electrons minus non-bonding electrons plus half of bonding electrons. And so to me that's a bit more confusing because we have to remember when I look at this structure right here, of course you should be thinking about this anyway, but it's easy to forget that this is actually one, two, oh, another one right here, three, four, five, six. There's actually six electrons in this triple bond, right? Because each stick is referring to two electrons, one from the carbon and one from the nitrogen, two electrons to bond it together. So when I look at the sticks, I only see three of them. And if I use the calculation from the book, it's going to say valence electrons minus non-bonding electrons. Well, that's easy. One, two, plus half of bonding electrons. And when I see one, two, three, I'm going to think, well, are there three bonding electrons? Or are there six bonding electrons? And then I have to do half of that because there's only half that come from the nitrogen and the other half come from the carbon. To me, that it just seems overly confusing. It's much easier, I think, to look at this calculation, balls plus sticks. So we look at each atom separately to calculate formal charge. We always have to calculate the formal charge for each atom separately. How many balls are on nitrogen? One, two. How many sticks are on nitrogen? One, two, three. So this part of the calculation, balls, two, sticks, three. That's easy enough. How about carbon? How many balls does carbon have? One, two. How many sticks does carbon have? One, two, three. So two plus three, same for carbon. So we're doing the same thing with bonding and non-bonding electrons, half of the bonding electrons, just counting the stick instead of the electrons inside. But it's easier to just think about balls plus sticks than half of the bonding electrons, I think. If you think it's easier the other way, then please use the other equation from the book. That's fine. So. The other part of this equation is the valence electrons. So how do we do valence electrons? OK, how do we find valence electrons? Remember, to find the number of valence electrons for an atom, we just find that atom in the periodic table. Carbon, C, here's carbon. And then go back to the beginning of that period, the beginning of the row. This is row number two, period number two. And count up to carbon. One, two, three, four. So that means carbon has four valence electrons. Now we do the same thing for nitrogen, N. Here's nitrogen. We find the beginning of the period that nitrogen is in, number two, and, it and we count up to nitrogen. One, two, three, four, five. So nitrogen has five valence electrons. So what we're saying then in the periodic table is that every time we're going across a row, we're actually filling up another shell of electrons. And then we go into the next row, and we fill up a new shell of electrons. And then the next row, and we fill up a new shell of electrons. So if I start at the beginning of a row, I can say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's how many electrons are in that outermost shell, the valence shell. All right, so the formal charge on each atom, carbon has four valence electrons, minus 2 plus 3 balls plus sticks. So 4 minus 5 equals negative 1 for carbon. Nitrogen comes in with five valence electrons. It's further in the periodic table than carbon. Five minus two plus three balls plus sticks. Five minus five equals zero. So nitrogen doesn't have a charge. The charge is zero. Atom, nitrogen atom is neutral. The carbon atom, after this calculation, has a negative one. That means the carbon atom has a negative charge. So now I can draw a more precise structure by drawing it like this. C N, and I don't have to have the brackets anymore. I can say, put the negative charge right on the carbon and say the negative charge is on carbon. I know which atom it's on. It's not, doesn't have to hang out here ambiguously. It's on carbon. Nitrogen is neutral. Carbon has a negative one charge. All right, let's try a couple more here. So the sum of all the formal charges on a particle equals the charge on the entire particle. 
So let's figure out the formal charges of each atom in a structure and then we add up all of those charges and that tells us the charge on the whole structure. So for example, this right here is sometimes symbolized as SO4 2 minus. So for example, this one over here is sometimes symbolized as SO4 2 minus. So when we look at the structure, I can see the S and the 1, 2, 3, 4 O's, SO4, but 2 minus, it's hard to see where the 2 minus is when I just look at this structure. So um, let's calculate the formal charge on each atom, and then we can see which atoms actually are neutral and which atoms have charges. So let's start with S. S has, we look at our periodic table here, here's S, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. S has 6 valence electrons. So 6 minus balls plus sticks. S doesn't have any balls, and it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sticks. 6 minus 6. I guess I could write that saying 0 balls plus 6 sticks. 6 minus 6 equals 0. So S does not have a charge. Um, let's look at the O. There's two different types of O here. So we'll look at this first one here. This O has two bonds. So each O, doesn't matter which, whether it has two bonds or one bond, each O has, here's O, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Each oxygen has six valence electrons. And in this structure, it has, let's do this one first, one, two, three, four balls, plus one, two sticks. So six minus six equals zero. Uh, now let's do, and I'll just point to it, this one. Now let's do this O. So oxygen always has six valence electrons because its place in the periodic table isn't going to change. So now let's see balls. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six balls plus how many sticks? One stick. So six minus six plus one, six minus seven equals negative one. So this one over here is in the same situation. It has one, two, three, four, five, six balls and one stick, just like this one does. So we can say that this oxygen is negative, and this oxygen is negative. This sulfur is neutral, zero charge. This oxygen is zero, is neutral, zero charge. And this oxygen down here looks just like this one. One, two, three, four lone pair electrons. One, two, three, four lone pair electrons two bonds, two bonds. So SO4 2 minus tells us there are two negative charges and here they are. One is on this oxygen and one is on this oxygen. So when I add up those charges, minus one, minus two, the total charge of SO4 equals minus one plus minus one. Right? That's what it's saying here, the sum of all formal charges. So plus, minus 1 plus minus 1 equals minus 2. This is the total charge on the particle. So let's do this one down here. Carbon has oops. Carbon has, here's carbon, one, two, three, four. Carbon has four. Minus balls, zero balls on carbon. Here's carbon. But it has one, two, three, four sticks. Zero plus four. 
So 4 minus 4 equals 0. No charge on carbon. Hydrogen. Hydrogen has one valence electron, first element. How many balls does hydrogen have around it? Zero. How many sticks? One. One minus one, zero. Let's look at nitrogen. We already saw that nitrogen has five valence electrons because of where it is on the table. How many balls does nitrogen have? Zero. How many sticks? One, two, three, four. Zero, so zero plus four. So this is five minus four plus one. Nitrogen has plus one. Oxygen, this first oxygen, has six valence electrons, four balls, two sticks. Six minus six, zero. The second oxygen, six valence electrons, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six balls plus one stick, six minus seven equals minus one. So we can put a plus right here next to nitrogen, and we can put a minus right here next to oxygen. And these are all neutral. Nitrogen is plus one, this oxygen is minus one. So what is the charge, the overall charge on this whole thing? Well, the total charge is plus one, plus minus one, zero. So this is a neutral particle right here. This particle is neutral overall. It does not have a charge, even though this atom does have a charge, and this atom does have a charge. But the plus and the minus cancel out. Plus one plus negative one equals zero. So this whole molecule does not have a charge, even though two of the atoms do. So we have to start thinking about whether we're talking about a property of an atom in a molecule, or are we talking about a property of the entire molecule? Because those are different things, and we're going to see down the road in this chapter that that matters. Are we talking about an atom, or are we talking about the whole molecule? So this atom is charged, positive. The whole molecule is neutral, because plus and minus cancel out. <coughs> Electronegativity. A bond is like a tug of war for electrons. The ability of an element to attract electrons within a covalent bond is called electronegativity. So when I'm looking at a bond, H, C, L, and there are two, two electrons in this, in this bond, remember each stick counts as two electrons, then what that really is, is the H is pulling on the rope for the tug of war, and the CL is pulling on the rope for the tug of war, and they're both trying to pull the electrons toward themselves, right? Pulling this way, pulling this way. So tug of war. I don't know if anybody even plays that anymore, but it's where one person or one team grabs this end of the rope, and the other person or the other team grabs this end of the rope, and they pull as hard as they can. And whoever is the strongest will pull the other team over, and they'll win the tug of war. So a bond is really the same thing. This H is pulling on those electrons. It's trying to pull the electrons toward it, because remember, the H is positive. It's got a positive nucleus. And the CL is pulling those electrons toward it this way, because the CL has a positive nucleus. So a bond between electrons, a bond between atoms, is just like a tug of war. So the electronegativity of an atom tells you how strong that atom is in the tug of war. These atoms over here are not very strong in a tug of war. They're going to lose in a tug of war. Francium, cesium, rubidium, all of these metals. But over here on this side, these are very strong in a tug of war. Fluorine is the strongest element of all. It has an electronegativity of 4.0. So that means when any element is in a bond with fluorine, fluorine is winning the tug of war and it's pulling all of the electrons in that bond toward itself. 
if francium is in a bond with an, another element, then it's losing the tug of war all, pretty much always because it's anything it's paired up with is bigger than it, is stronger than it. So when francium is in a bond with another element, it always loses the tug of war and it's losing its electrons. It always gets its electrons pulled away from it. So we can see that in general electronegativity increases like this across the periodic table. There are a couple of places where that trend doesn't hold true. Like here, these seem to be more electronegative than they should be. They're, they're blue, but we don't get blue until we get over here. And these guys that are yellow, they seem to be less electronegative, less electronegative than they should be, because it seems like they should be orange if they're following the same trend. But for the most part, it holds that down here, these are always the weakest on this side of the table, and these are always the strongest on this side of the table. So um, because a bond is a tug of war for electrons, then when two elements with identical values of electronegativity, like two atoms of the same element, form a covalent bond, they share the electrons equally. And there's no what we call a dipole moment. So that we would say that bond, the electrons are shared equally. It is nonpolar. So in Cl2, for example, one chlorine atom is over here, one chlorine atom is over here. There is a bond between them, and there, there's an electron that this chlorine brings and an electron that this chlorine brings, and they're both pulling. It's true that they're both pulling on the electrons because every atom always pulls on electrons, but the atoms pull on this electron equally because the Cl and Cl have the same electronegativity because they're the same atom. So we call this type of bond where nobody wins the tug of war nonpolar. Nobody wins. Nonpolar. Okay, here is another kind of bond with a tug of war. In this tug of war, we see, let's look up these values. Chlorine is 3.0, sodium is 0 0.9. So let's write that down here. 0 0.9. And chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0. And remember, electronegativity is like how strong it is. So chlorine, its strength is three time, more than three times greater than sodium. So if there was a bond here between these atoms like this, right, same thing, then the chlorine is winning this tug of war by a lot. It's more than three times stronger than sodium. So what does that mean if they're both pulling? and the chlorine is pulling way, way, way more than the sodium is. Well, what that means is that that electron actually gets taken by chlorine. Chlorine just takes it. It's pulling so hard that the sodium can't even hold on to it at all because sodium is very weak. All metals, most metals, have very low electronegativity. So what does that mean? That electron gets stolen from sodium and it just moves all the way over to chlorine. So notice that this shell does not overlap this shell. They're right next to each other because plus and minus are sticky to each other like magnets. But since their shells do not overlap, that means they are not sharing electrons because chlorine is so much stronger than sodium that it stole the electron. So what do we call this kind of bond where one side steals the electron and the other side gives the electron away? This is an ionic bond. So we've already, we already knew this. We'd be, even before we knew anything about electronegativity, we knew that sodium and chlorine is ionic. How do we know that? How did we know that? Because sodium is a metal. And chlorine is a nonmetal. Let's write NM, nonmetal. So in, in our previous assignment, metal and nonmetal makes an ionic bond. So now we know why a metal and a nonmetal makes an ionic bond. Because if we look back at our table, metals are always very weak, except for these guys. These guys are an anomaly. But for the most part, metals are always very, very weak. And nonmetals over here are always very, very strong. So when I pair up a metal and a nonmetal, like in an ionic bond, 
then the nonmetal steals the electron because of electronegativity, because it's very strong. But what happens if I pair up a nonmetal with a nonmetal, like a chlorine atom and a chlorine atom, two chlorine atoms together? Well, they're both really strong. If they're both really strong, then they share the electrons. That we call that a covalent bond. Nonmetal, nonmetal, covalent. Metal, nonmetal, ionic. So really what we were saying is that the difference is a difference in electronegativity. Metals have low electronegativity and nonmetals have high electronegativity. So in an ionic bond, somebody wins. The chlorine is the clear winner here. Steals the electron away from sodium. Here's the situation that we haven't seen before. So a bond is a tug of war for electrons. There is a bond here, just like there was in the other one. And in Cl and Cl, they share it evenly. In Na and Cl, the Cl just takes the electron, right, because it's so much stronger. But what about in this situation? H is a nonmetal. H has an electronegativity of 2.1. F is a metal, or a nonmetal, excuse me, nonmetal, nonmetal. Even though H is over on this side, it's still a nonmetal. So 2.1 and 4.0. 4, 0. 4 0. 2.1. So, sure, fluorine is stronger, almost, it's almost twice as strong, but hydrogen is still pretty strong. 2.1 is much bigger than 0.9 for the metals, so it's still pretty strong um, compared to fluorine. So they're both pulling. Hydrogen pulls a little bit, and fluorine pulls more. And so, since fluorine is pulling harder, what that means is that this electron that's next to hydrogen, hydrogen can't pull this electron away because fluorine is really strong at pulling electrons, so hydrogen can't get this one. But fluorine can get this one. So what happens to it? it fluorine doesn't steal it, but fluorine moves that electron closer to itself. So the electron that was right next to hydrogen, because hydrogen brought it in, remember, before we drew that bond, it looks like this, H, F, and then F has these the lone pairs here. Those are all pairs. Sorry, my messy drawing. So there's one single electron here and one single electron here. So before we draw this bond, this electron belongs to H. But after we stick them together, fluorine is stealing that electron away. So it hasn't completely stolen it. You can see that this sphere is still overlapping this sphere. But look, this sphere is huge compared to this one. So that means the electrons like to hang out over here. The electrons don't really like to hang out over here, even though they're stuck together. So what does that mean? Well, if this were sodium, we would call it plus be a full charge because sodium loses the electron, but hydrogen doesn't lose the electron, so it's not a full plus, it's a partial plus. So this symbol, delta, means partial. So the side that's getting its electron stolen, the H, gets a partial plus. And the side that is stealing the electron, the F, it's a partial minus. We call this a polar covalent bond. Polar. So the fluorine is pulling the electron toward itself. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is kind of what that looks like. The H in between an H and an O the H has less electronegativity than the O. The O can pull on the electrons harder. So if we're trying to make a plot of where are the electrons in a bond, well, we can only say that the electron can occupy certain spots. So we see all of these dots here. That doesn't mean all these dots are electrons. All of these dots are potential spots the electron can be. The electron could be here, 
or it could be here, or it could be here, or it could be here, or it could be here, or it could be here. So these are all the spots that the electron in, within this bond, between the O and the H, we're talking about the electrons that are in the bond, where could they be? Well, sometimes they're right around H. There's a lot of spots that are right around H here. Sometimes they're here in the middle. We can see there's a lot of spots that are right here in the middle. Sometimes those electrons are right around O. So because there are so many more possible locations for the electron over here, then that shows that the O is pulling that electron toward itself. If it wasn't pulling the electron toward itself and this was a nonpolar bond, the cloud would kind of look more like this. Or there would be just as many dots over by hydrogen as there were over by oxygen. But since there's more dots by oxygen, that shows that ox the electron likes to spend more of its time by oxygen, because oxygen is more electronegative. So we call that a polar covalent bond. And it's also what we call that, that we say that that molecule has a dipole moment. So if I were to draw water, and oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, then I would draw a dipole moment and show oxygen is taking the electrons. So this line here, these are called dipole moments. And the way that we draw a dipole moment is by putting this little, it's got kind of like a little cross over here. The little cross goes next to the partial positive side. H is partial positive, it's losing electrons. And the arrow points to the partial negative. That's how we make a dipole moment. A dipole moment is just indicating a separation of charge within the bond. So to summarize, if we have H and H, actually, if we have Cl and Cl, and we're talking about these electrons right here. The electrons in the bond. Well, Cl and Cl both have an electronegativity, oops, of 3.0. 3.0. So this is nonpolar. 3.0 minus 3.0 equals 0. No difference in electronegativity. Nonpolar. If we have a H and a Cl, H is 2.1, Cl is 3.0, so the difference here is 0 0.9. We call this polar. There's a difference in electronegativity, 0 0.9. It doesn't matter, this would actually be negative, right? 2.1 minus 3 would actually be negative 0 0.9. But let's just say it's really the absolute value. It doesn't matter if it's negative or positive. Make all of your differences positive. Because I, I would get the positive value if I did 3 minus 2.1. The order in which I subtract these isn't important. So we're just looking for the difference. How, what is the, the, diff the number? How much bigger is this number than this one? 0.9. All right, so let's look at the last situation here. If I have N, A, and C, L, now those electrons are right next to Cl. So if I were to draw the electron cloud where those electrons like to hang out around this molecule, they kind of like to hang out evenly around the H and the Cl. Around this molecule, they kind of like to hang around the Cl more than the H. And we can see that this electron is starting to move closer to the Cl. Around this molecule, the electrons 
are completely around the CL. They're not around the NA at all. So the way that we indicate that is here we say H is partial, let me change the color here. H is partial plus. It's losing its electron. CL is gaining that electron. It's partial minus. Down here, NA completely lost the electron. It's a full plus. It gets a complete plus charge. CL completely stole that electron. It's only around CL. That gets a full minus charge. So let's put these numbers down here. Remember, this one is 0 0.9 CL 3.0. So this is a difference of 2.1, and this kind of bond is called ionic. And these, are all, these up here are both covalent. So what we've done is we now have two different kinds of covalent bonds. Before, I could say a bond is covalent. It's made of nonmetal. Cl, Cl, nonmetal, nonmetal, covalent. H and Cl, nonmetal, nonmetal, covalent. But now I have to specify, is it nonpolar covalent because they're sharing the electrons evenly? Or is it a polar covalent bond because they're not sharing the electrons evenly? Because the Cl has more electronegativity, it's more electronegative. So the tug of war, it's stealing the electron away from H, which gives H a positive charge. Or it steals the electron completely away from a metal, which gives Na a complete positive charge and makes that bond ionic. So whether a bond is nonpolar or polar or ionic has to do with the difference in electronegativity. What is the difference in electronegativity between these two atoms? So here is um, a chart. I'm going to correct these numbers though. I would say this, oh yeah, this is good actually, 0 to 0 0.4. This should read something like 0 0.5 to 1.9. And this one is anything that's 2.0 or above. Although, and even though I'm, I'm changing this one, these numbers are not, uh, the one reason for changing it is because if you get a value of 0.4, where do you put it? Do you put it down here, 0 to 0.4, or do you put it up here, 0 to 0.4? So first of all, you have to change it because of the overlap. But um, giving a value for saying this is a pure covalent, which means nonpolar. I don't know why they don't just say nonpolar. Sometimes I can calculate an electronegativity difference that is within this range that is between 0.5 and 1.9, but it's still ionic. So sometimes an ionic bond falls within this range, even though this range says polar covalent. And sometimes I can calculate an electronegativity difference that's greater than 2.0, but that bond is actually polar covalent. It's not ionic. So th these numbers work 95% of the time. If you calculate an electronegativity difference within these ranges, 0 to 0 0.4, 0 0.5 to 1.9, or greater than 2.0, then you can say the bond is either nonpolar, or polar, or ionic. But that 5% of the time, that's not going to work, and, it, and the answer will be wrong. And there are, there are subtle differences in those situations that make that answer wrong. And we'll get to that later. It's a little bit more advanced. Right now, I want you to focus on getting the 95%, and we'll focus on the 5% later. So here is what I mean by that. Um, I, this is a continuum of uh, electronegativity. So here is an electronegativity difference right here of 1.9. 1.9 makes HF covalent. It's blue but 1.9 makes cesium iodide ionic. And look at this, lithium iodide is 1.5. The difference between lithium and iodine is 1.5, but it's ionic, it's red. This is 1.9 and it's covalent. So this is a smaller difference and it's ionic, and this is a bigger difference and it's polar covalent. So look, for the most part, over here, these are all low, they're all covalent. These are all high differences. They're all 
ionic. So 95% of the cases are going to fit within these categories. But there's a couple here that are weird, where the ionic one seems to be covalent and the covalent one seems to be ionic. So just be on the lookout for those differences. There are a few.